Inkheart by Cornelia Funk. Read by Robert Delancey. Chapter 5. Only a Picture. They had unwrapped the book. Maggie saw the brown paper lying on a chair. Neither of them noticed that she had come in. Eleanor was bending over one of the reading desks with Mo beside her. They both had their backs turned to the door. Amazing! I thought there wasn't a single copy left, Eleanor was saying. There are strange stories about this book going around. A second-hand dealer from whom I buy quite often told me that three copies were stolen from him a few years ago, all on the same day, too, and I've heard much the same story from two other booksellers. Really? Yes, very strange, said Mo. But Maggie knew his voice well enough to know that he was only pretending to be surprised. Well, anyway, if this wasn't a rare book, it means a lot to me. And I'd like to be sure it's in safe hands for a while, just till I come back for it. All books are in safe hands with me, replied Eleanor, sounding cross. You know that. They're my children, my inky children, and I look after them well. I keep the sunlight away from their pages. I dust them and protect them from hungry bookworms and grubby human fingers. This one shall have a place of honor, and no one will see it until you want it back. I don't really welcome visitors in my library. They just leave fingerprints and stray hairs in my poor books. Anyway, as you know, I have a very expensive burglar system. Yes, that's extremely reassuring. Mo's voice sounded relieved. Thank you, Eleanor. I am, really am most grateful. And if anyone comes knocking at your door in the near future, asking about the book, please, will you make out you've never heard of it? All right? Of course. I do anything for a good bookbinder. And anyway... You're my niece's husband. I really do miss her sometimes, you know. I expect you feel the same. Your daughter seems to be getting along all right without her, though. She hardly remembers her mother, said Mo quietly. Well, that's a blessing, wouldn't you say? Sometimes it's a good thing we don't remember things half as well as books do. But for them, we probably wouldn't know anything for very long. It would all be forgotten. The Trojan War... Columbus, Marco Polo, Shakespeare, all the amazing kings and gods of the past. Eleanor turned around and froze. Did I fail to hear you knock? she asked, staring so angrily that Maggie had to summon up all her courage not to turn around and slip quickly back into the hallway. How long have you been there, Maggie? asked Mo. Maggie stuck her chin out. She can see it, but you hide it away from me? she said. Attack, she knew is the best form of defense. You never hid any book away from me before. What's so special about this one? Will I go blind if I read it? Will it bite my fingers off? What terrible secrets are there in it that I shouldn't know? I have my reasons for not showing it to you, replied Mo. He looked very pale. Without another word, he went over and tried to lead her to the door. But Maggie tore herself away. Pig-headed, isn't she? remarked Eleanor. It almost makes me like her. Her mother was just the same, I remember. Come here. She stepped aside and beckoned Maggie over. Look, you can see there's nothing very exciting about this book. At least not to you. But see for yourself. We always were most likely to believe the evidence of our own eyes. Or doesn't your father agree? She cast Mo an inquiring glance. Mo hesitated, then resigned himself and nodded. The book was lying open on the reading desk. It didn't seem particularly old. Maggie knew that really old books looked alike. She had seen books in Moe's workshop with their pages spotted like leopard skin and almost as yellow. She remembered one with a binding that had been attacked by woodworms. The traces of their jaws had looked like tiny bullet holes, and Moe had gotten out his book block, carefully fixed the pages back together, then, as he put it, gave them a new dress. Such a dress could be made of leather or linen, It might be plain, or Mo might imprint a pattern on it with his tiny decorative stamps. This book was bound in linen, silvery green like willow leaves. The edges of the pages were slightly roughened, and the paper was still so pale that every letter stood out clear and black. A narrow red bookmark lay between the open pages. The right-hand page had an illustration on it, showing women in magnificent dresses, a fire-eater, acrobats, and a man who looked like a king. Maggie turned the pages. There weren't many illustrations, but the first letter of each chapter was itself a little decorative picture. 
Animals sat on some of these initial letters. Plants twined around others. One F burned bright as fire. The flames looked so real that Maggie touched them with one finger to make sure they weren't hot. The next chapter began with an N. An animal with a furry tail sat perched in the angle between the second and third strokes of the letter. No one saw him slip out of the town, read Maggie. But before she could get any further with the story, Eleanor closed the book in her face. I think that'll do, she said, tucking it under her arm. Your father's asked me to put this book somewhere safe for him, and so I will. Mo took Maggie's hand again, and this time she followed him. Please forget that book, Maggie, he whispered. It's an unlucky story. I'll get you a hundred others. Maggie just nodded. Before Mo closed the door behind them, she caught a last glance of Eleanor standing there, looking at the book lovingly, the way Mo sometimes looked at her when he put her to bed in the evening. Then the door was closed. "'Where will she put it?' asked Maggie as she followed Mo down the corridor. "'Oh, she has some very good hiding places for such things,' replied Mo evasively. "'But they're secret, as hiding places should be. "'Suppose I show you your room now.' He was trying to sound carefree, and not succeeding particularly well. It's like a room in an expensive hotel. No, much better. Sounds good, murmured Maggie, looking around, but there was no sign of Dustfinger. Where had he gone? She had to ask him something. At once. That was all she could think of, while Mo was showing her the room and telling her that everything was all right now. He just had to do his bookbinding work, and then they'd go home. Maggie nodded and pretended to be listening, but her mind was full of the question she wanted to ask Dustfinger. It burned on her lips so fiercely, she was surprised Mo didn't see it there. When Mo left her to go and get their bags from the camper van, Maggie went into the kitchen, but Dustfinger wasn't there either. She even looked for him in Eleanor's bedroom, but however many doors in the huge house she opened, there was no sign of him. Finally, she was too tired to go on searching. Mo had gone to bed long ago, and Eleanor had disappeared into her own bedroom. So Maggie went to her room and lay down on the big bed. She felt very lost in it, like a dwarf, as if she had shrunk. Like Alice in Wonderland, she thought, patting the floral sheets. Otherwise, she liked the room. It was full of books and pictures, and there was even a fireplace, although it looked as if no one had used it for at least a hundred years. Maggie swung her legs out of bed again and went over to the window. Outside, night had fallen long ago, and when she pushed the window shutters open, a cool breeze blew on her face. The only thing she could make out in the dark was the gravel forecourt in front of the house. A lamp cast pale light over the gray and white pebbles. Moe's striped van stood beside Eleanor's gray car, like a zebra lost in a horse's stable. Maggie thought of the house they had left in such a hurry, and her room there, and school, where her desk would have been empty today. She wasn't sure whether she felt homesick or not. She left the shutters open when she went back to bed. Mo had put her book box beside her. Wearily, she took out a book and tried to make herself a nice nest in its familiar words, but it was no good. Again and again, the thought of the other book blurred the words, Again and again, Maggie saw the big initial letters before her, large, colorful letters surrounded by figures whose story she didn't know because the book hadn't had time to tell her. I must find Dustfinger, she thought sleepily. He must be here somewhere. But then the book slipped from her fingers, and she fell asleep. The sun woke her the next morning. The air was still cool from the night before, but the sky was cloudless, and when Maggie leaned out of the window, she could see the lake gleaming in the distance beyond the branches of the trees. The room Eleanor had given her was on the first floor. Mo was sleeping only two doors farther along, but Dustfinger had had to make do with an attic room. Maggie had seen it when she was looking for him yesterday. It held nothing but a narrow bed surrounded by crates of books towering up to the rafters. Mo was already sitting at the table with Eleanor when Maggie came down to the kitchen for breakfast. But Dustfinger wasn't there. Oh, he's had breakfast already, said Eleanor sharply when Maggie asked about him, along with some animal, like a Pomeranian dog. 
It was sitting on the table, and it spat at me when I came into the kitchen. I wasn't expecting anything like that. I made it clear to your peculiar friend that flies are the only animals I allow anywhere near my kitchen table. And so he took the furry creature outside. What do you want him for? asked Mo. Oh, nothing special. I, I just wanted to ask him something, said Maggie. She hastily ate half a slice of bread, drank some of the horribly bitter cocoa Eleanor had made, and went out. She found Dustfinger behind the house, standing on a lawn of short, rather rough grass where a solitary deck chair stood next to a plaster angel. There was no sign of Gwyn. A few birds were quarreling among the red flowers of the rhododendron, and there stood Dustfinger, looking lost to the world and juggling. He plucked them out of the air so swiftly that it made her dizzy to watch him. She tried to count the colored balls. Four, six, eight... He stood on one leg to catch them, casually, as if he didn't even have to look. Only when he spotted Maggie did a ball escape his fingers and roll at her feet. Maggie picked it up and threw it back. Where did you learn to do that, she asked. It looked, well, wonderful. Dustfinger made her a mocking bow. There was that strange smile of his again. It's how I earned my living, he said, with the juggling and a few other things. How can you earn a living that way? At markets and fairs, at children's birthday parties. Did you ever go to one of those fairs where people pretend they still live in the medieval times? Maggie nodded. Yes, she had once been to a fair like that with Mo. There had been wonderful things there, so strange they might have come from another world, not just another time. Mo had bought her a box decorated with brightly colored stones and a little fish made of shiny green and gold metal with its mouth wide open and a jingle in its hollow body that rang like a little bell when you shook it. The air had smelled of freshly baked bread, smoke, and damp clothes, and Maggie had watched a smith making a sword, and had hidden behind Mo's back from a woman in a witch's costume. Dustfinger picked up his juggling balls and put them back in his bag, which was standing open on the grass behind him. Maggie went over to it and looked inside. She saw some bottles, some white cotton wool, and a carton of milk. But before she could see any more, Dustfinger closed the bag. Sorry, today it's secret, he said. Your father's given the book to Eleanor, hasn't he? Maggie shrugged her shoulders. It's all right, you can tell me. I know, anyway. I was listening. He's mad to leave it here. But what can I do? Dustfinger sat down on the deck chair. His backpack was on the grass next to him with a bushy tail spilling out of it. I saw Gwyn, said Maggie. Did ya? Dustfinger leaned back, closing his eyes. His hair looked even paler in the sunlight. So did I. He's in the backpack. It's the time of day when he sleeps. I mean, I saw him in the book. Maggie didn't take her eyes off Dustfinger's face as she said this, but it didn't move a muscle. His thoughts couldn't be read on his brow in the same way she could have read Moe's. Dustfinger's face was a closed book, and Maggie had the feeling that if anyone tried reading it, he would rap their knuckles. He was sitting on a letter, she went on, on a capital N. I saw his horns. Really? Dustfinger didn't even open his eyes. And do you know which of her thousands of shelves that mad bookwoman put it on? Maggie ignored his question. Why does Gwyn look like the animal in the book, she asked. Did you really stick those horns on him? Dustfinger opened his eyes and blinked up at the sun. Hmm. Did I? he inquired, looking at the sky. A few clouds were drifting over Eleanor's house. The sun disappeared behind one of them, and its shadow fell across the green glass like an ugly mark. Does your father often read aloud to you, Maggie? He asked Dustfinger. Maggie looked at him suspiciously. Then she knelt down beside the backpack and stroked Gwyn's silky tail. No, she said. "'but he taught me to read when I was five. "'Ask him why he doesn't read aloud to you,' said Dustfinger. "'And don't let him put you off with excuses.' "'What do you mean?' Maggie straightened up, feeling cross. "'He doesn't like reading aloud. That's all.' "'Dustfinger smiled. "'Leaning out of the deck chair, he put one hand into the backpack. "'Ah, that feels like a nice full stomach,' he commented. "'I think Gwyn had a good hunting last night.' I hope he hasn't been plundering a nest again. Perhaps it's just Eleanor's rolls and eggs. 
Gwyn's tail twitched back and forth, almost like a cat's. Maggie looked at the backpack with distaste. She was glad she couldn't see Gwyn's muzzle. There might still be blood on it. Dustfinger leaned back in Eleanor's deck chair. Shall I give you a performance this evening? Show you what the bottles, the cotton wool, and all the other mysterious things in my bag are for? He asked without looking at her. It has to be dark for that. Pitch dark. Are you scared to be outdoors in the middle of the night? Of course not, said Maggie, offended. Although really, she was not happy at all to be out in the dark. But first, tell me why you stuck those horns on Gwyn. And tell me what you know about the book. Dustfinger folded his arms behind his head. Oh, I know a lot about that book, he said. And perhaps I'll tell you some day. But first, the two of us have a date. Here, at eleven o'clock tonight. Okay? Maggie looked up at the blackbird singing its heart out on Eleanor's rooftop. Okay, she said. Eleven o'clock tonight. Then she went back to the house. Eleanor had suggested that Mo set up his workshop next door to the library. There was a little room where she kept her collection of old books about animals and plants, for there seemed to be no kind of book that Eleanor didn't collect. She kept this collection on shelves of pale, honey-colored wood. On some of the shelves, the books were propping up glass display cases of beetles pinned to cardboard, which only made Maggie dislike Eleanor all the more. By the only window was a handsome table with turned legs, but it was barely half as long as the one Moe had in his workshop at home. Perhaps that was why he was swearing quietly to himself when Maggie put her head around the door. Look at this table, he said. You could sort a stamp collection on it, but not bind books. This whole room is too small. Where am I going to put the press and my tools? Last time I worked up in the annex, but now they're filled with crates of books too. Maggie stroked the spines of the books crammed close together on the shelves. Just tell her you need a bigger table. Carefully, she took a book off the shelf. It contained pictures of the strangest insects, beetles with horns, beetles with proboscis. One even had a proper nose. Miggy passed her forefinger over the pastel-colored pictures. Mo, why haven't you ever read aloud to me? Her father turned around so sh sharply that the book almost fell from her hand. Why do you ask me that? You've been talking to Dustfinger, haven't you? What did he tell you? Nothing. Nothing at all. Maggie herself didn't know why she was lying. She put the beetle book back in its place. It felt almost as if someone were spinning a very fine web around the two of them. A web of secrets and lies closing in on them all the time. I think it's a good question, though, she said as she took an out another book. It was called Masters of Disguise. The creatures in it looked like live twigs or dry leaves. Moe turned his back to her again. He began laying out his implements on the table, even though it was too small. His folding tool on the left, then the round-headed hammer he used to tap the spines of books into shape, the sharp paper knife. He usually whistled under his breath as he worked, but now he was perfectly quiet. Maggie sensed his thoughts were far away. But where? Finally, he sat at the side of the table and he looked at her. I just don't like reading aloud, he said as if it was the most uninteresting subject in the world. You know I don't. That's all. But why not? I mean, you make up stories. You tell wonderful stories. You do all the voices and make it exciting and then funny. Mo crossed his arms over his chest as if hiding behind them. You could read me Tom Sawyer, suggested Maggie, or How the Rhinoceroses Got Their Skin. That was one of Mo's favorite stories. When she was smaller, they sometimes played at having crumbs in their clothes, like the crumbs in the rhino's skin. Yes, an excellent story, murmured Mo, turning his back to her again. He picked up the folder in which he kept his end papers and leafed absentmindedly through them. Every book should begin with attractive end papers, he had once told Maggie. Preferably in a dark color, dark red or dark blue, depending on the biting. When you open the book, it's like going to a theater. First you see the curtain, then it's pulled aside, and the show begins. Maggie, I really do have work to do now, he said without turning around. The sooner I'm through with Eleanor's books, the sooner we can go home again. Maggie put the book about creatures who are masters of disguise back in its place. Suppose he didn't stick the horns on, 
she asked. What? Gwyn's horns. Suppose Dustfinger didn't stick them on? Well, he did. Mo drew a chair up to the table that wasn't long enough for him. By the way, Eleanor's gone shopping. If you feel faint with hunger before she gets back, just make yourself a couple pancakes, okay? Okay, murmured Maggie. For a moment, she wondered whether to tell him about her date with Dustfinger that night. But then she decided against it. Do you think I can take some of these books to my room? she asked instead. I'm sure you can, so long as they don't disappear into your box. Like that book thief you once told me about? Maggie put three books under her left arm and four under her right. How many was that he stole? Thirty thousand? Forty thousand, said Mo. But at least he didn't kill the owners. No, that was the Spanish monk whose name I've forgotten. Maggie went over to the door and opened it with her toe. Dustfigure says Capricorn would kill you to get a hold of that book. She tried to make her voice sound casual. Would he, Mo? Maggie! Mo turned around with a paper knife, pretending to point it at her threateningly. Go lie in the sun or bury your pretty nose in those books, but please let me get some work done and tell Dustfinger I will carve him into very thin slices with this knife if he goes on telling you such nonsense. That's not a proper answer, said Maggie, making her way out into the hallway with an armful of books. Once in her room, she spread the books out on the huge bed and began to read. She read about beetles who moved into empty snail shells, as we might move into an empty house, about frogs shaped like leaves, and caterpillars with brightly colored spines on their backs, white-bearded monkeys, striped anteaters, and cats that dig in the ground for sweet potatoes. There seemed to be everything here, every creature Maggie could imagine, and even more that she could never have dreamed existed at all. But none of Eleanor's clever books said a word about Martin's with horns.